Hello everyone, uh, I'm really happy to be with you today. Uh, my name is Rico Eckstein uh, and today we're going to talk about building FTC3 enabled web applications. Uh, about a year ago, around about this time, uh, I was up on stage um, off Broadway in New York at OSSF 2019. Um, it was very exciting. Uh, this year things are a bit different. Uh, I'm doing this talk virtually, but in, in some ways uh, I am even more excited about the talk this year because um, what I want to do today is make FDC3 uh, really practical for people uh, in terms of a set of steps that you can use to, to build real FDC3 workflows. Uh, so uh, yeah, what are we going to talk about today? Um, first, uh, a short introduction to myself, um, and then we're going to just briefly talk about why FTC3. You know, why should you be interested in FTC3? Why are we using it? Uh, and then uh, just a quick recap about what FTC3 is uh, for people who are not that familiar with it. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, in five steps how you can build an FTC3 workflow. Then I'll um, say something about FTC3 in practice uh, in the, out in the real world and, and how people are using it today. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, uh, there will be some time for questions um, and I'll share my contact details with you um, in case you want to get in touch. Uh, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I started out as a software developer in Cape Town um, uh, almost 18 years ago and uh, I've been working in the financial industry in London for um, more than 15 years. Uh, I started out doing everything from Delphi and ASP uh, through to um, WPF and Flash. Uh, and nowadays I do uh, HTML5 and, um, and React, uh, you know, but I've also done DevOps and backend services, um, a whole lot of different things. Uh, at Adaptive uh, Financial Consulting, um, I'm the head of desktop strategy, and what that means is that I've worked on several industry leading desktop platforms over the years, and I advise clients on what desktop technologies to use, um, how to build collaborative workflows, and, and really how to um, put in place digital transformation uh, in their organizations when it comes to their financial desktops. Um, at Finos, uh, it's my great privilege to be the co-chair of the FTC3 project, um, and I am an active Finos contributor. You'll see a pull request from me every now and then. Uh, but enough about me. Uh, why FTC3? Uh, why are we here today talking about it? Well, uh, what's interesting is that you know, for a long time, we've kind of been building um, front-end systems this way. You have a bunch of microservices, and then uh, you have a big monolithic application that aggregates all of those services together and um, displays a single front-end to the user. Uh, that might be a single-page web application. Uh, it might, it um, might be a rich WPF application on the desktop. Uh, and this approach has, um, you know, some advantages. There's a single code base. Um, it's, it's often easier to, to deploy that way, um, but it also becomes unwieldy over time. And, and it's sometimes difficult for um, lots of people to work on this single application together. So, uh, you know, what we've seen over the last um, two years or so, uh, maybe even a bit longer than that um, in the financial industry is that people have started doing this type of thing where um, you break things up into uh, smaller pieces and you have individual micro front ends running on the desktop. Um, you kind of componentize your desktop into smaller pieces, much like you do with microservices on the back end. Uh, and um, the interesting thing to me about this approach is, uh, you know, even if you think about the microservices on the back end, is that just putting the components in place, whether it's on the desktop 
or on the back end, um, it's not necessarily enough by itself. Uh, you need a way uh, to orchestrate these components together. Uh, you need a way to uh, to discover them, to make it easier to deploy them. You need to establish patterns for them to communicate and collaborate with one another. Uh, on the back end, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes is an example of an orchestrator that people often use nowadays to, um, uh, to manage their microservices. And really the same thing is true of the front end. Uh, you need an orchestrator to help you with the micro front ends that you want to deploy to desktops. Uh, there are a lot of vendors that operate in the space that, that offer products um, that make it easier to deploy micro front ends, for example, in web containers running on the desktop. Um, they also help with things like, like window management, ease of deployment, um, registering applications, etc. Um, and this is really the space that FTT3 is targeted at. Uh, it is an attempt to standardize the patterns that we use on desktops for um, orchestrating uh, micro front ends. And uh, it's particularly important in the financial industry because people have multiple monitors, they're using applications from third parties, multiple departments internally, um, people want to do windowing and workspaces and all of these type of things. Uh, so in FTC3 there's a concept of a, a desktop agent uh, which is uh, really a standardized way, a standard context for managing front-end widgets or components. Uh, and the true power of um, componentization uh, comes when components don't work in isolation, but when you can connect them together, uh, which is one of the most important parts of FTC3 is that it offers a way to, a standard way for interoperability between components on the desktop. And while the analogy isn't perfect, I sometimes think of it as uh, the equivalent of REST for microservices, um, which is a way to pull microservices together, FTC3 provides a standard way to do that um, when you're orchestrating on the desktop. Uh, so why do we want to componentize components this way and compose them together this way? Um, well, it has several benefits for organizations and, and really they're analogous with some of the benefits you get from microservices. Uh, one of them is that you can, um, you can reduce costs this way. Um, you can work on particular desktop components independently, which means that um, different teams can build different uh, components in parallel. You can release them independently. Uh, they can be decoupled, um, you know, which means that uh, everything doesn't have to be necessarily on the same timeline and, and you remove this need sort of for big bang releases of a big monolithic UI. Uh, you can use different technologies um, for different components and they can still all work together. Uh, so we can just be much more efficient about how we build um, front-end components. Uh, similarly, we can unlock new opportunities. Uh, we can pull together um, applications that were previously not able to pull together because they are built in different um, departments. They're completely isolated from one another. There's no way for them to interact. With um, these type of patterns, we can uh, create new opportunities, new user workflows by, by um, connecting previously um, isolated pieces. It also offers a path to migration for those um, big legacy applications, which are so hard to make migrate because you can start to break things apart into smaller components, still keep the workflows in place and um, migrate them bit by bit or just the bits that make sense. Uh, we can even have new opportunities in the industry across organizations for various um, vendor products, um, third-party systems, um, STPs to all uh, work together. Uh, and finally, we can uh, 
start to leverage network effects on our desktops. My talk, my talk at OSSF last year was um, about leveraging the network effect. So uh, if you're interested in this, please go and look up that talk on YouTube. <clears throat> you, can, uh, you can find it there. Um, and really all of that this is about is uh, putting more nodes into place um, connecting, making more connections between those nodes, and you start to reach a critical mass where you start seeing in the, um, exponential value from uh, putting more pieces in place in your network. And this effect is behind a lot of the transformative um, movements in technology. Uh, so we really want to create an environment where we can start leveraging uh, that effect when we work with smaller components. Uh, so what is FTC3? Well, uh, uh, it stands for the Financial Desktop Connectivity and Collaboration Consortium, and it was started by OpenFin in 2017 and then uh, contributed to the FinTech Open Source Foundation, or FinOS. Um, and FDC3 um, aims to establish open standards for the financial desktop. Uh, the 1.0 specifications uh, were released last year um, and adopted uh, by quite a few organizations. In April of this year, we released the 1.1 specifications and the FTC3 Standards Working Group is uh, actively working on the 1.2 version at the moment. Um, we have a web portal at ftc3.fenos.org where we've tried really hard to make it easy for people to understand FTC3, understand the patterns. There's usage examples, API references, um, and other documentation. Um, please uh, go and have a look, um, get involved in the community. Um, it's all open source on GitHub, so everybody uh, can, can do pull requests, contribute, raise issues, etc. Uh, very recently, uh, we've been um, able to publish an NPM package for FTC3, which is something um, we've wanted to do for a long time. Um, and for those um, FTC3 applications using web technologies, um, this offers a great entry point and standardization of the types and operations you can use um, in an FTC3 uh, desktop context. Um, so we're quite excited uh, to be able to offer that to people. Please go and check it out. Um, FTC3 is, is made up out of um, four specifications really in the standard. And the first one is the app directory uh, specification, which just offers a shared way to register and discover applications. Um, the second specification um, is the intense specification. Um, if you've done Android development in the past, you might have come across intense, the concept of intense. And all they really are um, are well-known verbs that you can invoke or reference. Um, so for example, an application might uh, raise the uh, star chat intent or the um, view chart intent. And these intents are examples of standard public FTC3 intents. So they're well-known um, applications can use them. And another application will then um, be launched to respond to that intent with the idea that the applications don't need to know about each other, they just need to know about the intent. Uh, and what goes um, closely in hand with this um, is the data that you exchange as part of the intent being raised. So, uh, you know, if it's a star chat intent, some information about the contact uh, that you want to chat to, if it's a um, view chart intent, you might want to send the instrument information that you want to view the chart for. So FTC3 provides a standard envelope for exchanging contextual data. Uh, and it also includes some standardized um, contacts for things like instruments and contacts that people can use. And finally, uh, there's a shared set of uh, deliberately small and lightweight operations that applications can use to collaborate with FTC3. And FTC3 is agnostic of which um, desktop environment or which technology it's running in. Um, a lot of people use uh, uh, web technology to, to write desktop applications at the moment. So uh, that's where we see it used most common, but you can also use 
the APIs and the other specifications with, for example, .NET applications running on the desktop. So that's FTC3. Um, let's, let's try and make things practical now. Um, so what I want to do today is share just five steps with you that you can follow for building FTC3 enabled web applications. And the key point here is really that uh, we are not building a single application, but we're building a workflow. Um, when you're doing componentized desktops and interoperability on the desktop, uh, you're really thinking about how multiple applications work together. Uh, so you're not designing the behavior and the look and feel of a um, single application anymore. You, you're designing the collective behavior and look and feel of multiple applications. And um, the designing the workflow is an important step that that people often miss out. Uh, you've got to think carefully about how everything is going to interact because that informs everything else. So we're going to start off by doing that. Uh, then we're going to define the actions that the applications are going to use to collaborate. We're going to model the data for those actions. We're going to register the applications with the FTC3 desktop agent. And finally, we're going to use the FTC3 APIs to make it all come together. Uh, so the workflow I've chosen for today uh, is an FTC3 trading app um, with which you can trade FX currency pairs. So there's some streaming prices, you can click buy or sell, and it then um, it will uh, say that there's a pending trade um, for a particular notional at that price. The buttons then become disabled while that trade is pending. Uh, this will then um, launch automatically, dynamically, um, an execution app, which will receive the information about the trade that uh, that needs to be done. And that trade can then be accepted or rejected, uh, which will remove it from the status and add it to the trade blotter. And then it will return the, um, the status either accept or reject for of the trade to the trading application which will update its status. Uh, so this is a, um, a relatively contrived example, but I wanted to simplify things down um, to something that is nice and simple for us to work with. Um, in the real world, uh, the same person um, might not do all of these actions and might not, might not all be happening on the same desktop. But um, yeah, I think, if we, if we follow the steps that I mentioned um, for this workflow, uh, it will help to illustrate how you can do some similar things with real workflows. So um, now we need to define the actions that the applications need to collaborate. Um, and how do we start with that? Well, the great thing is we now have a workflow, so we can use that to help inform the actions that need to take place. So the first thing is the trading app needs to raise an intent so that the execution app can come up and respond to that. So we're going to call that intent execute trade. We're going to raise an execute trade intent. Um, and that's going to carry along the data of the trade that needs to be executed so that the other application can use it. And then when the user clicks accept or reject, uh, it needs to return the trade result um, to the original application. Uh, now, at the moment in FTC 3.1.1, um, intents are sort of one way. Um, they don't return data, but in FTC 3.1.2, we're currently working on intents that re, um, uh, return data. Because this is a F FTC 3.1.1 workflow, um, I'm going to use a different mechanism from, from FTC, th FTC 3 to return the data. Um, and this is uh, called channels or broadcasting. So we can create um, an, what's called an app channel, which is a, a channel that both applications know about. Um, and we can return the trade result via that channel. And this is also serves um, to show off a bit more about the available FTC 3 APIs. 
So we know that the two actions we're going to need are to raise an intent and to broadcast on a channel. And for each of these actions, we basically need an identifier. So in the case of raising an intent, we've already said this is the execute trade intent that we're going to define. Um, and along with that intent, uh, we need to define the data that will come with it and how that payload looks. And we're going to call that a trade request. So for the raise intent action, the identifier and the data is really the only two things that both applications need to know about. They don't need to know um, about anything else or about each other. Um, but these are the two pieces of shared um, and agreed um, data or identifiers that the collaboration is going to be based on. Um, for the broadcast uh, on the channel, uh, we need to agree what to call the channel so that both applications can reference it. So we're going to call it the trade result channel. That's going to be its identifier. And we need to model a trade result that can be exchanged on that channel. So for the two actions, these are the four pieces of um, data that are the minimum that we need to, to couple and connect this workflow together. Right, so how do we model a trade request now that we know we need it? Um, so in FTC3, we've adopted JSON schema to help model data. Um, and some of the existing FTC3 um, data types are modeled with JSON schema. It's not the only way to do it, uh, but I, I've come to kind of like JSON schema. Um, I find it intuitive and logical once you understand how it works. And I'm going to try and show you today how you can use it to um, model the trade request. So uh, to start off with, you need to say what version of the schema you're using, um, the identifier of the schema, and then just that we're um, modeling an object which we're going to call trade request. So that's kind of the header of the schema. Uh, so this is the first nice thing is we can now reference existing FTC3 schemas to help us. In this case, what I'm saying is I'm going to base my schema on the FTC3 1.1 base context schema. Um, so that has the minimum properties that an and FTC3 context type needs to have. Um, and really all that is in that schema uh, is a, a type property, which is needs to be a string, which identifies the type of data we are exchanging. So when we are um, extending that schema into a trade request, we're going to be a bit more specific and we're going to say, well, it's not any string anymore. We know what the type is in this case. It's an adaptive dot trade request. Um, and here we're using a convention in FTC3, which is to prefix the um, context types with the organization who's defining the type. So the standardized FTC3 schemas um, use FTC3 dot and then the name of the type. So we're going to have an adaptive dot trade request type on our payload. And then um, what FTC3 um, also has is sort of a bag of identifiers for this data, which applications can use to um, decide if the data is relevant to them. Um, so in our case, we are just going to require that there's a trade request ID uh, as, um, as a minimum. Uh, that's going to be the only identifier for this um, object that we're going to require. Applications can stick other things in, in that bag if they want to, but um, this is our only requirement. And then we need to represent the instrument that is being traded. And here is a great example of how we can compose more complex types from existing FTC3 uh, context types. So I'm using the FTC3 1.1 instrument schema here, and I'm just saying we're going to have an instrument property which has an object which um, has the shape of an FTC3 instrument schema. And then we're going to add some additional things like, is it a buy or a sell? What the notional is? What the price is? Uh, and if I want to, I can also use some other FTC3 schemas to represent the counterparty or the contact for the trade. I'm not using that in this workflow, but I just wanted to show um, how you can use composition to build up, you know, complex types. So. Um, for this example, they're not going to be required 
as part of the data type. So I haven't included that counterparty or contact in the required list of properties, but they can still be used um, optionally. So there's our trade request schema. Um, how would that look in practice? Uh, well, there's an example of a trade request that adheres to the schema. So there's the type at the top, the um, identifiers, which includes the trade request ID, the instrument, which uses the shape of an FTC3 instrument schema, um, and then the side notional price and the counterparty, um, just to show how that would look. And there's our trade request. Um, for trade result, it's much the same thing. Um, we're going to have a type, which in this case is adaptive to our trade result. Um, we're going to have some identifiers. Let's say in this case, we kind of want to know both the trade ID and the trade request ID for this trade result. And now I can reuse my trade request schema uh, in this trade result schema by just referencing it. So I can say there's going to be a trade request, which is going to have um, a, an object that adheres to the trade request schema inside it. Um, and I might want to add the status, which is accepted or rejected, and the timestamp for the trade to that. Um, so that gives me my trade results schema. Um, and now we're done modeling the data. Um, and uh, what I want to show you now um, is quite a cool little tool that we've used in a few um, projects uh, that are FTC3 related. Um, and this tool is called QuickType, um, and it can be used to, um, to generate code from JSON schema for the types that you want to use in applications. So I'm just going to quickly show that to you. Um, what I've got here is the same trade request schema that we've just modeled. Um, and by just sticking it into QuickType, it will generate um, TypeScript types for me and a utility method to, to uh, uh, go from uh, and to JSON payloads uh, with those types. Um, so that is quite cool, I think. Um, you can also do things like say that you wanted to verify uh, it, uh, validate it according to the schema. If you wanted to, it will generate all of that code for you. Um, and it really works for just about any language that you want to use. Um, so for example, um, if you want to generate the code in Java, it will uh, use Jackson to and do all of the formatters for you to um, serialize and, and deserialize to and from JSON. Um, and similarly, if you're using C Sharp, you know, it will use uh, JSON.NET to create the, the types with the right attributes for you. Um, and QuickType is an open source project. It's on GitHub and it is also an NPM package with a command line tool that you can install to, to use it in your projects. Um, so that's QuickType. Uh, it's a nice tool when you're doing data modeling to then use those types in your code. And that what, that's what we've done in this example as well. Um, so what have we done so far? We have uh, We've designed the workflow that we're going to use. We've um, defined the actions for that workflow, and we've modeled the data that those actions are going to use. Um, now we need to register our applications with the FTC3 desktop agent. Why do we need to do that? Um, well, if you think about it, what, what's really happening here is that one application is going to raise an intent and then the other application is going to magically appear. Um, what's happen happening in reality is there's an FTC3 compliant app directory which has a record of all of the applications. And when one application raises an intent, the desktop agent is going to use the app directory um, to find the right application to raise that will accept that intent. Um, so the app directory is uh, an open API REST schema. So it's sitting somewhere in the cloud and it will, um, the applications are registered with it and the desktop agent use it to uh, m pull the workflows together. Uh, you know, so if we've registered our trading app with it, um, it will then go and um, find 
the right app to meet the intent and, and launch it um, on demand. Um, so to make it work, what we've got to do is we've just got to add um, a record with the REST API or with a UI to the app directory uh, with the identifier for the app, the name for the app, the manifest, um, for example. You know, it will have windowing information, um, et cetera, uh, that is needed to launch the app um, and other properties like icons or descriptions that you need might need or use for an, an application launcher. Uh, but you know those are sort of the minimum things you you need to define for the app and then for the execution app we need a little bit more than that <clears throat> uh, we need to to tell the um, app directory and the desktop agent which intents this app responds to so that it <clears throat> it knows to launch the app on demand um, so in this case we're going to add execute trade intent to the intense array for this application. Um, and we're also going to say that the contexts that uh, this app understands for the execute trade um, intent is the adaptive.trade request that we've defined. I can specify as many contexts as I want, but the key thing here is that uh, the uh, desktop agent can use this information to route to the right application. Uh, and now you also understand why the type property of, of context data in FTC3 is the only required uh, bit because um, it's used for um, filtering and routing requests between applications. Right, so doing this, we've registered our applications with the app directory. And now the only thing that's left to do is to actually write the code uh, and use the FTC3 APIs to um, put the workflow together. So that's uh, easier than it um, might sound. Um, there's just a few operations we need to use. Uh, to start off with, we probably, um, both applications need a reference to this channel that has been agreed ahead of time so that the trade result can be exchanged. Um, so having got a reference to that channel, the trading app then wants to add a context listener for the adaptive.trade result type that we've defined um, so that it can receive it and um, so that it can then update the status about whether the trade has been accepted or rejected. And it probably wants to, the, to do this uh, before it raises the intent because um, if it does it after raising the intent, it might miss the trade result while it's still setting up the listener. So we're doing it ahead of time. Uh, then we're going to, uh, you know, build up the trade request according to the uh, schema that we've defined. Um, and then we just raise the intent, the execute trade intent, and we pass it the trade request um, that the other application will need. Uh, all that the execution app needs to do is it needs to set up an intent listener for the execute trade intent, and it will receive the trade request. And then, um, you know, it displays it uh, and the user accepts or rejects the trade. So we build up the trade result. We embed the trade request in it according to our schema. And then um, we are going to uh, broadcast the trade result back to the trading app on the channel that we've defined, um, at which point it will go to the context listener on the trading app. And that's all we need to. That's all we need to do. Um, we've now um, followed all of the steps to build our FTC three workflow. Um, so uh, yeah, let's see it in action. Um, I'm going to show you a demo of this trade workflow now that follows these steps that we've defined. Right. Uh, so what I've got here is a. A uh, sandbox that we use at Adaptive to um, to test and and experiment with FTC three applications, um, and this sandbox uh, just runs in the browser. Um, it opens other browser windows and it uses post message to um, communicate between windows. So this just goes to show that FTC three isn't opinionated about what desktop framework it is running in. Um, it just provides uh, the the standards and, and the connectivity to, to bring the workflows together. So um, from this desktop agent, um, 
from this sandbox, uh, I can launch my trading app. Um, I can launch my execution app, right? And what you will see is um, I'm now going to try and do a trade and, and show off the workflow as we've designed it. So here I'm going to click sell and it's going to say that the trade is pending. Um, but the problem is that the execution app um, hasn't come up to respond to that. And the reason for that um, is that uh, I haven't written that code yet and we're now going to do that together. So. Uh, what I've got here is the code for the trading app and the execution app. They're both relatively simple React applications uh, that use React hooks um, to wire everything together. Um, so they both define some state. Um, and what you will see here uh, is that uh, both applications um, get the trade results channel that we've defined. Um, and then the trading app sets up a context listener for the trade result. And if it receives a trade result, it will add it to the state. And, um, and this is the code for uh, handling a trade. Uh, so when a trade button is clicked, um, we build up the trade request with the information from that trade action, like the side and the notion on the price. Uh, and we set it as the pending trade, but now we need to raise the intent so that it can transfer to the other application. So I'm going to do that now. So I'm going to say await ftc 3raise intent, and the intent I want to raise is called execute trade. Oops. And I am going to pass our trade request to the intent. So I'm going to save this file. Um, this is uh, live watching the code, the, the web application. Um, so hopefully uh, if the live watching works correctly, um, by adding this line, um, it will now, my workflow will now work correctly. So let's see if that worked. Um, so I'm just going to close it down and open it again. Right, so let's see if that works. Ah, it worked. So just by raising the intent, the desktop agent has now brought forward the right application. It's displaying the data and I can now accept or reject. Um, this might not be a surprise to you, but when I accept or, re or reject, um, it's going to add the trade to the blotter, but it doesn't report back to the original application. And again, that's because I haven't implemented that bit yet. Um, so I'm going to do that now. Uh, so um, on this side is the execution app. Uh, we've uh, taken the channel, we've added it to the application state. We've set up an intent listener and when the trade request comes in, uh, we're adding it to the application state. So here I'm going to handle the trade execution when you click the accept or reject button. So we're building up our trade result according to the schema. We're putting our trade request inside it along with the status, whether it's accept or reject. Um, here we're adding it to the blotter. So what I need to do now is I need to use the channel that I've got a reference to and just broadcast back the trade result, um, which will hopefully hit the um, context listener on the other side. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to save it. Again, if the live watching is working correctly, um, the workflow should now work. So I'm going to close this guy down. Let's just reload this guy. Right. So let's see if our workflow works. So I'm going to buy the trade. I'm going to reject it. And now this application is updated with the status. So just with that, I've implemented my workflow using the FTC3 APIs. The desktop agent is smart enough to know um, if I do it again, that this application is already running. Um, it doesn't have to launch it again and I can, um, it can just do the same thing over again. Right, so there's my FTC3 workflow implemented. Um, and just to show you that FTC3 isn't opinionated about what desktop environment it runs in, um, I'm now going to uh, be brave and try and run this workflow in another um, desktop uh, agent. Um, 
uh, OpenFIN in this case. Um, and I'm going to use the same applications and register them with the FTC3 app directory of OpenFIN. And hopefully, that will work. So uh, let's bring up my console. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to run everything up in OpenFIN. And so this is now the same sandbox that is running in OpenFIN. Um, but in this case, it's just an application now. And it's delegating all desktop agent responsibilities to OpenFIN, who, which is acting as a desktop agent now. So I'm no longer running in a browser window. I'm running on an OpenFIN window on the desktop. And um, I should still be able to launch my app just like before. And uh, um, it will come up. And if I click buy or sell, it will still use Ray's intent. But in this case, OpenFIN will resolve that intent and should launch the right application for me. So if I do that, um, the execution app comes up uh, and I can now accept or reject the trade. And it works just like I've showed you, but it's now doing it in a different um, uh, desktop agent because both are using the same FTC3 standards. And that's really um, the true power and beauty of FTC3. Right, uh, so, so that's our trade workflow. Um, so just to summarize, um, we've gone through five steps to build an FTC3 workflow. And I just want to list them again and notice how each step follows into the next one. Um, so this kind of a, a logical order to them. We design the workflow, which then helps us to define the actions we want to use, which then um, determines how we model the data. Uh, then we register the applications with the types that we've defined, and then we can use the FTC3 APIs for the workflow. Uh, so just to show that this is not all smoke and mirrors, um, I want to show, uh, just to tell you about a project that I've worked on where we used FTC3 in practice in the real world um, for a successful project that Adaptive has done. Um, very often we can't talk about the projects we do for our clients, um, but in this particular case, uh, the client at West Markets has agreed to do some publicity with us. And I can tell you about the Scout project. Uh, there's a case study on our website, which you can go and download and read more about it. And what we built, um, I uh, was involved with this project and, and I was the tech lead for this project along with some um, people at Adaptive and at West Markets. Uh, we uh, put in place a full desktop workflow incorporating the Symfony chat platform, OpenFIN and Finsemble, and RFQ de desktop components, some of which were written in um, WPF and some which were written in um, web technologies with, with React running on the desktop. Uh, and for this, we used um, FTC3 intents. We used the FTC3 context data uh, schemas and modeled some data. We used the FTC3 APIs. And uh, it was a wonderful workflow where, um, you know, you could, uh, salespeople could chat to customers in Symfony. Um, and, and at the click of a button, they could transfer into um, components running on the desktop where they can do pricing and then send um, those uh, prices for an RFQ back to um, to the customer they were talking out all seamlessly all done with FTC3 and um, and desktop agents uh, yeah so that was a, a, a very successful project and it shows how people are leveraging FTC3 um, in the real world to to solve problems on the desktop and that's really what uh, what we do at Adaptive. We we um, you know deliver bespoke software solutions for our clients. Um, we've been doing it for more than eight years. Um, we've you know delivered more than seventy five solutions. Of uh, I, I counted them, and I think at least eighteen of those were desktop integration projects using many of the same patterns and approaches that I've talked uh, with you about today, and so much more. Uh, so, 
if you uh, want to come and speak to us about a similar project at your organization, please do so. Uh, we, we'd be more than happy to talk to you and, and, and help you with that. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, you know, we're willing to share our expertise with the community. We can come and do a presentation inside your organization about FTC3, about desktop strategy. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also offered to do workshops and training for organizations about FTC3, whether that's for your developers or your stakeholders. Uh, please get in touch with us if you're interested in that. Uh, yeah, so, so that's everything. Um, I've put my contact details up there. Uh, if you'd like to, me, uh, to send me a message, to ask a question um, or to comment, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, it's been wonderful to be able to speak to you today and thank you very much uh, for your time.